He's wonderful. The little chorus, I'm not going to burst out into song, but it says, isn't he wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Oh, the wonder of it all, that God should love me. The name of Jesus is so sweet. I love its music to repeat. Some of these old hymn writers really had, uh, uh, they could understand the doctrines of love and the doctrines of our Savior's name and what it meant. And some of the nonsense that is called hymns today. Folks, we need to get good hymnology. Is that the right word? Amen. But again. <laughs> and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's wonderful in his birth, his life, his words, his death, his resurrection, his promises. He's wonderful in everything that he does. As I said, there's a comma here. Brings out a distinction, as it were, between the two words. Some of the so-called versions today leave out the punctuation marks and uh, leave out a lot of other stuff, but every jot and every tittle is important. He is called Wonderful. He is called Counselor. Two distinct wonderful truths about our Lord Jesus Christ. Counselor. Our Lord counseled on just about every truth of relevance to man. He expounded on sin and exposed it, especially to those who were the Pharisees and the hypocrites of his day. He says, woe unto you, uh, Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whited sepulchers. Oh, you look good on the outside. You're all white and pure and clean. You may even say the right things, but inside you're full of corruption. Death still uh, reigns in you. He preached on sin and he exposed it. We don't have preachers, not many. Praise God for the independent Baptist churches. Praise God for the fundamentalist churches around today. But we do not have too many men today preaching against sin and the horribleness of the penalty of sin. Our Lord expounded sin and he pointed the finger and says, You are a hypocrite. You say one thing and do another. He preached on sin. He preached on salvation and provided it. He expounded on service and entered into it. He preached on time and eternity, truth and testimony, faith and fidelity, hypocrisy, apostasy. He administered comfort and rebuke. He built up. He pulled down that which was false. He spoke on prayer. He spoke on fasting. His words were instructive. His words were constructive. And if necessary, his words were destructive. He spoke to a variety of listeners. He spoke to the Pharisees. He spoke to the Sadducees. He spoke to the priests, the publicans, the doctors, the lawyers. He spoke to the scribes. He spoke to the soldiers. He spoke to princes, peasants, kings, governors, rulers, rabbis, Gentiles, and Jews. He was a counselor. Every subject that was relevant to those that he came in contact with, he distinguished, yet he made no difference. He certainly was a counselor. He certainly was wonderful. And as such, we can say, yes, he is a wonderful counselor. He is wonderful. He is counselor. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Oh, the cults don't like this. 
They do not believe this. Other religions do not accept this. In our day, the liberals and even some of the neo-evangelicals are denying this. He is the mighty God. Here, I see no doubt. I, I see with beyond doubt that in these verses of Scripture, it absolutely destroys the JWs and others like them. Destroys their doctrine in relation to Jesus Christ. Mind you, there's lots of other passages we can turn to. But here we see the child that was born and the son that was given is the mighty God. Not just a good man. Not just a prophet. Not just a God. But he is the mighty God. When he was born, he was God. When he was 12 years of age, he was God. When he was on that cross, dying for my sin, he was God. He always was God, and he never will cease to be God. Some would argue that this falls short of the almighty God. Yet, he is called the Almighty God. Please turn over to Isaiah chapter 10. Or here we see God called mighty makes him equal with God. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 10 verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Jesus is called the mighty God. Jehovah is called the mighty God. Now please turn to Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32 and verses 17 through 19. It says, uh, Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out uh, and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thy showest loving kindness unto thousands, and re recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is his name. And there are many other chapters in the Word of God. Genesis 49, Psalm 50, uh, again, Jeremiah 32, later on, it talks about the mighty God. And here we have in this little verse, in Isaiah chapter 9, that he is called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. A child is born, a son is given, and he is the mighty God. Then he is the everlasting Father. The mighty God, the everlasting Father. The Father of eternity. The one who imparts eternal life unto us. To those that believe. <coughs> the very first verse in scripture opens up with that fact. In the beginning... God. He is the everlasting Father. In the beginning, God. God was always there. He is the Father of the ages. He is the Ancient of Days. There was never a time, as I said, that God was not. This is one of the great truths of the Bible. The beginning and the ending. That's what God is called. Which is. Which was. And is to come. The Almighty. The everlasting Father. Before the world was. He is. See God is not confined to time. He is. 
and always is. In a sense, we are eternal beings, but not in the same sense as God. God is eternal in the true sense of the word. When nothing else was there, God is. God was. It's usually the way we say it. We, when we were born, became eternally destined to the future. Whatever that future might be. Now, folks, if there's someone here today that has never dealt with where they will spend eternity, time is running out. Time is short, the Word of God says. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you want to spend eternity with Christ, then you need to be saved. You need to accept the one who came as a child. You need to accept the one who is the Son of God. You need to accept the one who will bear the government upon his shoulder. You need to accept the one who is wonderful, who is counselor, who is the mighty God. Because if you do not, then you will still live for eternity, but it will be eternal death. God is eternal. Now listen, folks, for the sake of time, I'll just read these verses or, uh, where you can find it. In Psalm 90 and verse 2, it talks about the immutability of God. God never changes. He loved us in eternity past. In eternity past, he framed the plan of salvation. He loved us in Jesus Christ, and his love has never changed for us. If something goes wrong in our life, it's because we have walked away from God. God does not walk away from us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He is immutable. His love for us cannot change. He never changes. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 23 onwards, it speaks much of the love of God which never changes. In Isaiah 63 and verse 16, his name is everlasting and every knee shall bow. We read that again in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 to 11. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that he is God to the glory of God. The eternal God is thy refuge, the word of God says. And all underneath are the everlasting arms. He is the everlasting God, the eternal God, the everlasting Father. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of of peace. This, of course, is a, the beautiful word, shalom. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee. I understand when the translators were translating that, that the word shalom is mentioned twice. And it wouldn't have made a lot of sense in English, thou shalt keep him in peace, peace. And so they put down the next best thing. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stead upon thee. Those in the Middle East, when they greet one another, they would say, Shalom, peace. But if it's a special person, if it's someone that you are uh, very close to, then you would say, Shalom, Shalom. A double blessing, a double peace. He is the prince of peace. When he was born, the angel said, peace on earth. To many during his ministry, he said, go in peace. At Golgotha, he made peace by the shedding of his blood. When risen from the dead, he stood in the midst of his followers and said, peace unto you. When he was in the midst of the storm, he said, Peace, be still. He is the Prince of Peace. For to be carnally...